Thank you for having me. Thank you to Mark, especially for inviting me to Momo. This is both an absolute pleasure to speak here, but also to be back in Amsterdam. I used to live here three years ago at the beginning of what then became this big thing called the Internet of Things, and I hope that you can see the connections as to why Amsterdam in the Netherlands is also very, very connected to that world and why you should definitely be proud of that. So uh, I run a company called Tinkerit. We're based in London in what some have coined the Silicon Roundabout, um, which is uh, London's answer to Silicon Valley, I suppose. Um, very small businesses in East London in the dodgiest parts of town uh, doing strange things and strange business models. It's a lot of fun and I really enjoy it very much. Um, we have been concentrating on basically three areas. Uh, all the things that have to do with the Internet of Things, physical computing, interaction design, and rethinking how all this online stuff lives offline. I'm not going to talk too much about my business because that's kind of boring. I'm going to talk about um, the histories. So I came to the Internet of Things conversation around 2005, um, and so it's been five years of people talking about it, people building businesses around it, and also people appropriating different sides of it. And for me, there are two stories. Uh, there's the top-down story. So uh, don't try to read this. I realized it was too small. Um, the top-down stories is big businesses doing big things at a big scale. So we can think about barcodes, and when they were introduced, we can think about uh, experiments in Xerox Park and Philips Research and all those kinds of environments. Uh, the Nabastag, uh, the iPod and Nike, all the things that uh, were mentioned by Meno previously. And that story has been ongoing, has been very rich. But there's also another story, which is the bottom-down story, the bottom-up story. Who here, your 400 people, who here has heard of Arduino? Raise your hands. Not good enough. <laughs> so um, the bottom-up story for me starts at the creation of a platform called Arduino, and I'll talk about what it is. Um, then you had things like Shaping Things by Bruce Sterling, uh, Everywhere by Adam Greenfield, Making Things Talk by Tom Igo, which were all publications and books and projects that people either did in academia or in the background, in their back gardens, and small projects that are starting to build the Internet of Things outside of companies and in people's homes. So Arduino, um, Italian, born in Italy as a project. It was an academic project uh, from some people at a school called Interaction Design Institute Ivrea, very, very long. We called it IDII when I was studying there. Um, and it has sold 150,000 units around the world so far. What is it? It's this thing. It's the size of a credit card. You plug it into your computer with a USB regular cable, um, and it basically allows you to connect to the outside world or to do things in the outside world. So sensors, actuators, all the things that we were talking about. This is open source, the software for it is free, you can download it online, uh, and it's 20 euros. If you want to build one yourself in your kitchen sink, you can, because it's open source, so everything is published. And this is a tool that has been growing in use from academia, initially because it was an academic project, to artists, designers, and now corporations that are seeing it as a lightweight way of doing prototyping, of doing innovative product design and prototypes. So this is kind of day one of what you might do if you were using an Arduino. It's kind of a mess. Um, yes, there might be soldering involved, beware. Um, and it's very, you know, it's still, you're not quite sure what you're doing, you're exploring, you're using Google a lot. And then this might be day 50, where you've actually got a solid idea, you've gone to Fab Lab, you've gotten your shell made, et cetera. You have your electronics 
really reduced down to what you want. And then you have something that you can either show a client, or you can show an investor, or you can show a manufacturing company. And then they'll go, yeah, yeah, I can make that, no problem. I'm saying 50 days, and it's probably not that much. So what does this mean, and what does this platform mean, and what does this bottom-up approach to design mean when we're talking about the Internet of Things? Right now, we're in this world where you and I can communicate on different levels. We have direct communication. I can walk up to you and say hi. Uh, and then I have my devices. My devices, because I've checked into Foursquare, tell me that there are 50 of you who've checked into Foursquare, too. Um, and so there's, this, there's these different layers that we're using to communicate with each other. And what the Internet of Things is implying is actually that my things can also allow me to communicate with you. So for example, a concept that I developed years ago, um, if I switch my light on at home, and my significant other is in another country, and a smaller version of his light lights up, maybe that tells him I'm home and he can give me a call. It's not about that object talking to anything else. It's not about that object necessarily having any agency but allows me to be connected in some way that isn't as direct. And maybe that's a good thing. So it's about extending ourselves and our actions. Um, this is the, I swear, four slides of self-promotion, only four. Um, just to also give this a little bit more flesh. This is a project that we did for Nokia. Nokia has a uh, phone that they've come out with, the N900, which was open source. And we made a series of products and product extensions to show off that phone. One of which was, because the phone can transmit FM, which means it can transmit an FM signal, uh, you would text an artist to that phone. That phone would look up on Last.fm, which is this music sharing service, it would look up on Last FM what the most famous song of that artist was and what the album cover was, and the phone would show the album cover and transmit to the old school radio that song. And so wirelessly, that radio is playing a song that you've just selected through the internet. Kind of weird, right? Um, in the wonderful world of mobile, Sony Ericsson had a whole campaign in London around space hoppers. If you've never played with one of these, you're too young. Um, you could use Twitter and create a hashtag and create a keyword and use, use it on Twitter. And then this would send a message out to this massive grid, which was in a warehouse. And then it would send a little bit of air into each space hopper. And this entire process was streamed live for two weeks so that you could see these space hoppers inflating and then being removed when they were done, that nothing exploded. Not that that wouldn't have been much fun, you know. Um, we had, this is a small project we made internally, which was a box, which uh, was for me, basically, because I was tired of uh, checking our online account uh, to see if anybody had been talking about us on Twitter. So every, point, every time someone addressed you on Twitter, a little bird would have its wings move and tweet physically, like there'd be a little song. Um, so that was, you know, a way for me to not be glued to my screen and actually have meetings. Um, we made this strange sculpture for, uh, for actually a boys school. This is one of the oldest boys schools in London. They turned 500 years old. Um, and they were kind of keen to get the students, but also the parents and the benefactors of the school to understand why they invested so heavily in technology courses for their young kids. And so they were like, okay, make something. I don't care what it is, but everybody has to be able to in get involved. So we built a physical bar graph. So you went online on this little computer, you selected a word. That word would then be looked up on Google Archive. So all the archives of everything that's ever been printed. And then these physical bars would raise up and down over for an entire century to show how often that word had been used. So little kids were looking for words like, you know, cat and dog. And then adults were looking for Facebook, Bush, you know, Second World War, etc. So you could physically see these online trends, which we're quite used to because, you know, we Google, it's 
0.33 seconds later, you have results. And this was slower. This was with more anticipation. So um, all these areas and all this kind of stuff kind of covers areas that we're sort of comfortable with. You know, There's lots around the city and urban cities and open data and all that kind of stuff has been really, really active. Uh, me and my friends, that connection is quite clear. We're quite happy to engage with that. Um, my stuff in my home and the stuff that kind of, you know, that exists at home, a little less so. And I actually think if I was going to be a little bit forward thinking in this, and because I have claimed that, it, you know, what's the next five years of the internet of things, I think this is where the meat is. Um, and I'm hoping that I answer your question slash comment as well in the meantime. Um, because I think that's actually a really strange black box that we create in our lives. The simple reasons that we don't like our homes to be smart. You know, we come at home and I certainly get home, I have less than nothing in terms of technology. I don't have a TV. I kind of hate technology at home because I have so much of it at the office. That's kind of my space. It's my private life. I'm perfectly happy people knowing through Twitter that I'm making eggs, but I don't want them in my home. So there's this contradiction with the way in which we live our lives, where when we invade the private space, it's actually quite a sensitive subject. And, you know, home automation. Ooh. It's kind of, you know, ooh, it's not sexy at all. Um, home automation or demotics, et cetera, it's an environment that's actually quite, yes, very top-down, incredibly functional, and quite boring, frankly. Uh, and if I wanted the light to come onto my closet every time I opened it, you know, I'd probably do that myself or wouldn't bother, really. So again, if I had to bank on a particular topic, which I think could change things, I think energy and energy tracking and our personal energy will be the killer app if we wanted to think about how this internet of things could happen at home. Governments have to cut down. We all collectively have to cut down. We're all interested in cutting down because that you know, ends up being smaller bills for us. But it's also an area where we can probably work in really interesting ways. And you know, again, like why bother? Why energy? Because these guys are thinking about it. Google Power Meter is a service that allows you to track what your energy use is online. And it's Google. So hey, it's cool, right? Uh, Microsoft came up with Home. Less sexy as a title. But yes, well done. Um, there's a wonderful service also in an office near, uh, near us in London called Amy, who do carbon counting for governments. And they've just got 5.5 million pounds in investment. It's quite a lot of money. That means that some people think this is, this is it. And, you know, energy. OK, you're tracking energy, or you want something to tell you that you're wasting too much energy, you want to involve people in a conversation about their home life that no one's really ever had. And some people have. And those are the hackers, funnily enough, with platforms like Arduino, among other things. Um, this was an ambient orb that Nicholas O'Leary, who works at IBM, uh, built for his home. He wanted to track how much energy he was using, and so instead of having a, you know, a display and numbers and something that was a bit too, too much, he built an orb. And so that orb glowed, changed colors depending on how much energy he was using, etc. Sam, am I out of time? Ah, oh, thank you. Um, the current cost, the current cost is a product, it's a UK product, and it's one of the fastest growing energy meters. And they're very, very interested in this connection to Arduino, and it's actually something that people did pretty quickly. People bought this meter uh, and hooked it up to Arduino to do something and to either produce information online that they could see remotely because they weren't at home, or they hooked up their appliances and got it talking through Arduino. This is all 
stuff you can Google, and this is all stuff that's online. Um, and then you have to think about, okay, well, if, you know, how are the ways in which I'm going to be told that I'm wasting too much energy? Um, so Adrian McEwen, who works uh, and lives in Liverpool, built this bubblino. So he uses it in conferences every time someone uses the conference hashtag, the bubbles blow next to the speaker, which yeah, is kind of fun. Uh, but if you had it at home, it would also be a really nice way to say, hey, just you know, take it easy on the washing machine right now. It's not a good time. So the building blocks are there because the electronics kind of exist, and they exist in a way that involves everybody. If all of, you know, I don't know, 10 of you today uh, decided to Google Arduino, you go to arduino.cc and you go, well, I want to buy one in the Netherlands. Uh, there's a shop in the Netherlands that sells them. Uh, you, with no programming experience or electronic experience whatsoever, could have something done and could build something. Um, wonderful project from MIT called Scratch, which is basically trying to teach programming to your grandmother, which means that everybody here could learn how to program very simple things. So if all you want to do is be able to track when the door of, the, of your cat opens and closes because you're you know, interested in where your cat is, you could do that fairly easily. Um, I know that some of the next speakers will be talking about this area, but you know, personal informatics is also an area that's very, very rich. Um, if I can tell what's happening in my own home, I can also tell what's happening with me uh, and what I should be keeping track of with my own health, etc. And so you have two examples here of you know a top-down approach of a very wonderful, you know, wonderfully designed product. But that doesn't mean that that product can't also be made at home, and you can't also make 10 and sell it to your friends if you wanted to. These micro-businesses are emerging from the ability for anyone to pick up programming, electronics, etc., and then selling them and just making micro-markets out of them in the same way that we have microfinance. And then once you have, you know, your house is hooked up and your appliances are hooked up and everything, what do you do with it? Uh, again, another wonderful service who are around the corner from us in London called Patch Bay. Um, it's, don't know why it's written Patch Bay, but it's Patch Bay. Uh, they allow you to basically post up and be public about your data. So if you wanted to actually share your energy consumption with your friends, you could do that. And, uh, you could you know, either compare that between households or compare that across countries because you knew that someone had a similar family structure or a bigger house or a smaller house. Uh, all that is now public data. You go to Patch Bay and you can see tons of feeds of different sensors and different projects that people have made. And even historically, even projects that aren't working anymore, that data is still there for you to use. And of course, one of the big things when people talk about the Internet of Things is, oh, you know, what about our privacy? Um, and I think that now we're very, very, we're so informed about that that we recognize the mechanisms that we can use when we want that or we don't. So um, Tower Bridge, uh, all the bridges now in London are hooked up to Twitter. So you can go to London Bridge or Tower Bridge, et cetera, and you can see what are the boats that are going past the bridge when it opens. Um, versus Andy Stanford Clark, who is a researcher at IBM, who hooked up his entire house to Twitter, again using these low-level electronics. And so he can tell when the doorbell's been ringing, he forgot the gas, etc. But it's a private account. It's him and his wife who have access to it. That's pretty much all that needs to happen. And I also think, with respects to privacy, that, you know, absent is the new present. The nicest and most um, interesting way to be very public about the fact that you want to be private is when you say you're off the grid on Foursquare, for example. If you don't use Foursquare, you should. It's kind of fun. Um, and this is very 2010, whereas in 2006, um, this is a very early screenshot of what Jaiku had imagined. Uh, and Jaiku was developed here in Amsterdam, partly. Uh, 
was ways in which you could tell if someone was around because their, all their devices were turned on. So if my phone through Bluetooth could tell my computer that I was around, I was probably there and I probably, that probably meant green. So back then it was all about online all the time and now it's more about, no, no, I'm here but I'm not and you're not gonna know about it. 30 seconds. <gasps> Extra time. So um, what are we doing about it? You know, how are we kind of looking at all this area of home, uh, et cetera? Uh, we're, we announced a uh, research project that we're taking part in, and uh, it's called HomeSense. Uh, so if you Google it, you might find it. Uh, well, hopefully you'll find it. Um, and we will be looking at running a very large-scale project around this with a corporate partner, but in a really open way, which is kind of fun, that I can't announce yet, uh, but I... Your name? Wart uh, Um I have a question about uh, your urge to re-embody the disembodied uh, media. So we have 200 years where we disconnected the voices from the bodies and hear them from the radio. Um, I see two things happening in your home when you're building your private uh, Twitter notifier. Mm -hmm. Is one, it gets useless to a lot of other people because only you know what's happening. Mm -hmm. uh, and second, that's good for your privacy because you lose the notification of what's good and what's bad um, in, the, in the common ground. So um, what do you think will prevail? The privacy of the or uselessness of everything that's built by uh, individuals? I don't know. I mean, is uh, the uselessness of everything that's built by individuals online make that less relevant? I don't necessarily think so. And so I don't think it's, it will happen offline either, you know. Uh, if anything online has taught us that every voice is worth, it's not worth it for everyone, but it's worth it for the people who you care about saying these things to, right? So a sense of privacy and a sense of network is only defined by yourself. If you want to broadcast that you've been using too much energy to half the planet, you're going to have to work a little bit harder uh, than just saying it to your wife or to your kids and, and all that, you know. So I think, I don't think that uh, we'll lose a sense of uh, our, you know, our immediate environment and we will lose the habits that we've developed online by dealing offline. Okay, another question maybe in the back now that I'm here anyway. Oh. I got a Twitter question from M. De Lange. Is he in the, uh, in the audience? Do you know what question it was? Yeah. Well, you were saying <clears throat> that uh, you were referring to this MIT proje uh, project, uh, programming for your grandma, and were saying, why couldn't stuff be made at home? So I was thinking, um, is according to you the Internet of Things a new way to consume, perhaps, to build your own stuff? I don't think so, because there's a difference between building your own stuff, and I come from a product design background, um, and there's a massive difference between building your own stuff and knowing how to tweak it and change it uh, versus I've bought this one purpose thing. It's not working anymore. What do I do? Oh, well, I'll just check it away. Uh, it is a massive relationship difference, I think. Uh, if you actually get involved in making something and you actually educate people as to what that means, uh, then they can, ex they can expect it from other consumer products. You know? In the same ways that, sorry? Uh, in the same ways that, um, you know, you used to be able to open the top of a car and be able to fix it, right? Right now, there's like a USB slot, and that's it. So eventually, with, uh, this, there is an open source car project in the US as well, uh, but eventually people will go back to thinking, well, actually, I really do want to be involved in how this object is either functioning or how I'm able to repurpose it. And that, I think, slows down consumption because then it's not about the one, you know, silo 
that that company has decided that I fit the target audience that then buys that product that then disposes of that product. Hi, um, Stefan van Kerk, Axi on Twitter. Um, a question about inspiration. What was the moment that you uh, were first inspired by the Internet of Things? Can you sort of describe the physical situation where you saw this light or, or something move and, and that was a spark that started this or something that you want to share? Um, hmm. so, the first, so the first time I heard about this concept, it wasn't even called that. It was called blogjects. Um, and it was, a coin, it was a term that was coined by Julian Bleeker, who now works at uh, Nokia, and uh, Nicolas Nova, who co-organizes Lyft Conference. I don't know if you've heard about it. Yeah, yeah there we go. Nicolas was here. And uh, it was great because Julian was suggesting in, in you know, a kind of tongue-in-cheek kind of way, you know, what if, what if pigeons could blog? What would they say? And I thought, like, that makes no sense whatsoever. Um, and I think, you know, I was studying interaction design at the time. I was doing a master's. And I thought, this is really interesting, because I've always been wanting to question how we relate to objects. And I'm using online on one side. I'm using things on the other side. And I'm engaging with the physical world. And I'm engaging with products around me. There's no connection. This, you know, and could there be a benefit to that connection? Could there be, of course there are, you know, of course there are problems, of course it makes people think hard about what that actually means and what the implications are in terms of design, in terms of, uh, you know, how do I know that something is intelligent? Is it because it's gonna have a semicode on it or an RFID on it? How do I know the RFID is there? There are tons of really interesting design questions and I think it makes me more passionate about products than it did when I was just being a product designer. And, you know, I think uh, we've had our fair share of salt and pepper shakers. Hi, my name is Claire Boonstra. Um, I was wondering, why is there such a big difference between um, what you do yourself and what you consider to be your consumer? Or you're talking a lot about people who and... Sorry? People they and people who use and consumers do. Yep, yep. And there's apparently a big difference between what you think your consumers are doing mm -hmm. and what yourself are doing. Sure. Well, Why is that? Um, I mean, in, in my case, like all the examples that were most of the examples that I've given are from people themselves. I haven't had to guess what they've made, they've just made it, um, which is kind of fun because all of it and, you know, all that Arduino does as, as an example of a technology uh, is enable people to make things. The fact that they've... But what you to make things? That's the point. Why are you talking about people as if they are external beings? Uh, you I don't know. I only question, represent Stephen. me, usually. <laughs> Unless Stephen. I've been cloned somewhere. <laughs> what, what, I don't understand. What, what's your point? You're talking about people. Yeah. Sure. Uh, I guess I'm using the word people in a different way than, you know, one might use. But uh, whether you want to call it, I don't like the word users necessarily, uh, because I think people, you know, design, yeah. design and drugs are the only two fields that use the word users. Sure. So it's easier for me to think about a person, about, you know, my, my niece, my mom, my grandmother, uh, than it is, you know, and those are people. They're not necessarily users. They're not anonymous. We'll leave it at that uh, for now, I would say. <laughs> Thank you, Alexandra.